Good evening. My name is Adam Chaplain, and I serve as Arlington's town manager. I'm here tonight to welcome you to this session and also to provide a brief introduction of where we've been on this issue and where we are planning to go after tonight. If you've not had the opportunity to read the detailed overview of the events that have brought us to this point in time, I encourage you to do so. That information was provided on the invitation to this event and is also available on the town's website. I'd like to start by acknowledging a few things. First, we are all living in a moment of national reckoning around issues of race, which has brought to the forefront many issues that have been present, but unfortunately not addressed in our society. Tonight's dialogue would be difficult under the best of circumstances, but it is certainly even more challenging when considered in the context of this reckoning. Next, I want to acknowledge that the intended outcomes of both the conventional discipline and restorative justice processes that Lieutenant Padrini went through have not yet turned out as planned. When we started these dual approaches nearly two years ago, we did so with a desire to hold Lieutenant Padrini accountable for his actions, to begin a path to healing the community, and to open a dialogue with all of our police officers about the very problematic nature of Lieutenant Padrini's words. While we have worked towards all of those intended outcomes and undoubtedly have made progress there's still ample work to do. And it's our hope that tonight is a significant part of that work, particularly work toward healing the community. It is my hope that the engagement that Lieutenant Padrini is undertaking tonight will allow us to move beyond this specific issue and to begin opening the door to broader discussions in the community around race and equity. To be clear, I do not view tonight as an ending, but rather as a beginning, a beginning of a dialogue around race and policing, the beginning of a dialogue around housing opportunities, and the beginning of a dialogue about the identification and the eradication of institutionally racist policies and practices in each and every town department. We have already started some of this work, but it is imperative that we redouble our efforts on making progress on all of these fronts. I am committed to and look forward to the hard road ahead as we come together to have difficult conversations that are focused on enhancing and expanding Arlington's inclusivity and equity. Now, We'll be turning to a recorded apology by Lieutenant Padrini, followed by a live session with Lieutenant Padrini, led by Michael Curry Esquire, former president of the Boston branch of the NAACP. Thank you all for your time, attention, and your continued commitment to Arlington. Well, there's still no audio coming through, so I'm going to recommend we skip this recorded apology and open the dialogue between Michael Curry and Lieutenant Padrini. And I apologize to everybody that tested this multiple times today and can't explain what's happening right now. Hi, everyone. Uh, it is uh, an honor to be here with the town of Arlington uh, for a conversation with Lieutenant Padrini. Uh, apologize as well for the technology. I think we're all in these very difficult times where uh, we spend most of our days on Zoom uh, or one of those other tools uh, with our children or work um, or with our doctors and providers. And we're always dealing with this uh, shift in technology, the shift to technology. So I want to apologize on that. Um, maybe just the opening remark before we start a conversation with Lieutenant Petrini. 
Um, I can tell you, I do this work across the country uh, as a former president of the Boston NAACP and a member of the National NAACP Board of Directors. Uh, and I probably do and facilitate, I should say, three of these types of conversations a week. Uh, credit to the town of Arlington uh, for the work that is doing uh, to uh, address issues of systemic racism uh, and to have conversations like this tonight with Lieutenant Pegrini. So I just wanted to acknowledge the town. It is not common. Uh, and I think that the town will benefit, the rest of the country will benefit from the town of Arlington's example tonight. Uh, Lieutenant Pedrini, I want to jump right in. We have a lot to talk about, uh, and we didn't get a chance. So how are you this evening, first of all? Excuse me, I, I couldn't hear you. Excuse me, Mr. Curry? How are you this evening, Lieutenant Pedrini? I'm, I'm doing good. And, and Mr. Curry, I have I have that statement. If if the uh, if the panel wants to hear me read it, I wasn't prepared to read it tonight, but I can certainly do that right now. So I, I, think, I, think, I think it would help. I think that makes sense, Lieutenant Pedrini. I think people would love to hear you uh, provide that statement. Go right ahead. I would like to take this opportunity to apologize for my comments published in the editorials that I authored in the MPA Sentinel magazine in 2018. My words were crude, highly offensive, and thoughtless. For this, I am truly sorry, and I apologize to everyone that I have offended or hurt in any way with these articles. I realize my words have damaged the well-earned relationship of trust and respect between the department and the community. I especially want to personally apologize to members of the community who feel marginalized and oppressed. I was insensitive in my commentary and I take full responsibility for this. After hearing from the Arlington community members, I am able to look at what I wrote through the eyes of others and realize now how deeply hurtful my words were. I also acknowledge that what I wrote offended many in the law enforcement community as well. Here in Massachusetts, we have a reputation for leading the nation when it comes to community policing and the concepts of 21st century policing. My columns damage that reputation. I want to reassure members of the public who are frightened by my writings that my words in these columns are not reflective of me or my leadership style. My irresponsible actions damage the reputation of the Arlington Police Department and cause tremendous harm to the relationships that the department has worked so hard to establish. I apologize to everyone for publishing writings that are inconsistent with the department's values. I'm especially remorseful for damaging the trust between the community and the APD. I know I will have to work for a long time to rebuild that trust. I have learned a lot from this experience and about how the words I wrote created severe harm. I am not a racist. I am married to a proud woman of color. Our children are of mixed race. My in-laws live on tribal land. We celebrate that native heritage. I look forward to mending the harm done and moving forward in the right direction. I'm committed to meeting with community groups and contributing on matters pertaining to police policy, whether there is juvenile justice, police legitimacy and transparency, use of force issues, or any other topic that would give me more insight into other people's lived experiences or gain empathy for those who have had negative interactions with the police. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Pedrini. I think it actually uh, was uh, fortuitous, for lack of a better word, that you, you got a chance to read that live. I think people wanted to hear from you live anyway. So I know we had intended to do audio, uh, but I think uh, a recording, but I think people benefited from hearing it. Uh, look, Lieutenant Pedrini, I, I want to start here um, with what you had written. Uh, and your views uh, over two years ago. Uh, one of the things that you referenced in your piece and what drove a lot of your writings was the anger around uh, the murder of police officers. Uh, I wanna, on this call tonight, say this and on behalf of social justice, civil rights activists across the country, uh, that when those two Los Angeles police officers were shot recently in their car, we mourned and, and, and were concerned with their, for their lives as well. I think we get into these toxic environments on uh, on race and on social justice issues that uh, we don't often hear each other. So I wanted you to know, as we get into the conversation, that whether it's those officers or Chesna or Gannon or Rose or any of the rest of those that you mentioned in your articles, most of America grieves when we lose a police officer. We understand the critical work that you do, all of you do, uh, and the challenges as you're in the street saving lives, quite frankly, but we also can have a conversation about police misconduct, police abuses, and police murder, quite frankly. 
So I wanted to start there, kind of, can you take us back? I know this is, seems like a, a long journey, go back two years ago with what you were feeling, experiencing uh, in the wake of those murders. Can you take us back to where you were and, and what you were thinking when you wrote those pieces? Um, I've been writing those columns for the MPA Sentinel Magazine for a number of years. Uh, they started out as just mostly legislative updates, legal defense updates, collective bargaining trends, things like that. Just kind of current, current events, what was going on at the time, three times a year. And those magazines were mailed to uh, members at their homes, mailed to police departments, and then given out at our annual business meetings. In the spring of 2018, there was a controversial criminal justice reform bill. And I say controversial because it was, it was wide sweeping. And there were even police leaders, well, there were police leaders on both sides who couldn't agree on, on some of the reforms that were in that omnibus bill. Ultimately ended up passing and, uh, and it was signed by the governor just around the time that Sean Gannon was killed. Uh, in April, Sean Gannon was ambushed in Yarmouth doing something that we consider routine. He was serving a probation warrant. He didn't have a chance to react. He didn't have a chance to de-escalate. He was, he was murdered, checking the attic, looking for the suspect. The suspect was taken into custody unharmed. There was no excessive force issues or anything. And, and we're, police officers throughout the Commonwealth were emotional about this. His canine partner near was shot. And, uh, but for the care of the Cape Cod veterinary staff and, and one retired Yamas police officer in, in particular, uh, Nero would have died as well. So when the time between, the time following Sergeant Gannon's death in the police union and legislative community, we tried to introduce some, what we thought were common sense reforms through the Senate budget process filing some amendments to the Senate budget process. And the governor ended up filing um, death penalty legislation for those who murdered a police officer. Then July hit and uh, Sergeant Chesna was murdered. Again, another very routine call for service on a Sunday morning at the end of his shift. It was a disturbance after a motor vehicle crash. He was surprised by the suspect. He didn't have a chance to de-escalate. He was assaulted, rendered incapacitated, and then murdered with his own firearm. Two weeks after that, two officers responding to a disturbance in a yard in Falmouth on a Friday afternoon were ambushed and shot, one in the neck, one in the torso. Again, that suspect was apprehended with no excessive use of force. So when I was writing these particular columns, I was emotional, I was angry. Um, those guys weren't, weren't killed in some crazy shootout after a bank robbery. They were killed serving a warrant. They were killed responding to disturbances. They weren't killed in high crime neighborhoods. Sergeant Chesna was killed in a community that's very similar demographically to Arlington on a Sunday morning for a, a disturbance after a car crash. The Falmouth officers in, in Yama, Sergeant Gannon, that's where we go on vacation. Those, those are vacation spots, Yarmouth and Falmouth. I had friends who were down in Falmouth on that day in question, and I just returned from Yarmouth from vacation on Labor Day. There was a lot of anger and emotion I mean, obviously that manifested itself in what I wrote. And Lieutenant Pedrini, I think in line with that, so we all, I'm sure we all on this call, uh, some 300 people now on this call have been in situations where we've been upset uh, and we find places to emote, right? We can emote to our loved ones or we could, you know, some people do it online. You actually, actually use the publication to do it in your regular column. Um, the problem is words matter. 
Uh, and what you said in that column um, really created some division, not just in the town of Arlington, but as you know, this piece went statewide and became a talking point across the state. And you had some pretty divisive and um, uh, inflammatory things to say in the piece that I want you to address. And, and I think folks on this call want to know, what were you thinking? Because you can say I was angry, but oftentimes what you really think comes out when you're angry, right? And, and, and in your case, you talked about uh, being sick and tired of social justice warriors telling us how to do our job. You talked about uh, meet violence with violence, um, forgetting restraint, measured uh, responses, procedural justice, de-escalation, stigma reduction, and other feel-good BS that is getting officers killed. Now, you have to juxtapose all of this stuff you were saying with what we were seeing play out across the country where people were asking for restraints on police abuses and these things. How do you reconcile what you said um, to what was happening across the country? And, and, and did you understand where those calls were coming from? Right. When I wrote that, it was it was in the context of the Chesna incident. Um, Michael Chesna didn't have a chance to de-escalate and it cost him his life. It made his wife a widow and his children fatherless. When I wrote that, to me, I was writing about being in that moment. I've been a proponent of those progressive police principles my whole career. But what I, when I was writing that, I was talking about in that moment, when you're about to get incapacitated, you have to meet that violence with violence. That's the use of force continuum. I was never talking about initiating violence or, or taking the fight to somebody. That's just not what we do. Now, as I step back and I look at what I wrote through the eyes of others, through people who've had a different experience with the police or a different experience growing up than I have, or who didn't really, who don't come from a police professional background, when you take those words, I see now that they were crude. They were harsh. They were certainly insensitive. And, uh, and I certainly can empathize with anybody who, who felt harm or felt in danger from, from, from what I wrote. Lieutenant, I think there are many on the call tonight and many who will see this uh, recording when it's all said and done and will think about whether you were really representing the interests of other officers who also get frustrated with the criminal justice system, who are also frustrated uh, with uh, the criminal justice reform bill, who may be frustrated with the police reform bill that's moving in the legislature right now, who feel uh, cops' lives matter, right? Uh, and that you, and I'm, I'm sure there's some right now who are frustrated that you're online even apologizing for what you said. Um, I'd be curious how you'd respond to those folks, right? Because it's not just about responding to the folks that are on this call that are upset and are angry and felt like your words were uh, offensive and harmful and racist uh, or xenophobic. What about the folks who actually are right online right now and, and really feel like what you said was the truth or was necessary? Well, the police community isn't a monolith. We have, we all come from different backgrounds. We all have different political opinions. I think that the audience that I was writing to understood, even though it was harsh and crude and offensive, where I was coming from. Um, I think the vast majority of police officers recognize that reform of our profession is needed. After the things we've seen this summer, things we've seen in years past, I think everybody can agree that there is some form, some reform that, that needs to take place in this profession. Now, Lieutenant, I'm gonna push back on you a little bit on that. And I know, and I'm glad uh, for the town, uh, created some opportunities for you and I to talk in advance of this. So we got to build a relationship and get to know each other. Uh, and one of the things I appreciated in getting to know you is we had a, a real talk and it wasn't uh, uh, a contentious one. It was one with a civil rights activist and a lieutenant uh, who made some really uh, offensive statements. And one of the things I pushed back on you on is this whole notion, uh, one, that you said that you're not racist. Because I think that there's a conversation. One of the things that drives me crazy as civil rights activists 
is when someone says they're not racist, but they don't know what it means, right? That we don't have a common shared definition of it. And having a black friend or a Latinx friend uh, or black biracial children does not disqualify anyone from being racist. It's about your views. It's about power and privilege and how that manifests in you as a teacher, uh, as a police officer, by the decisions you make, what comes out your mouth, uh, how you treat people. So I want to just make that clear, uh, uh, Lieutenant Pedrini, that we have to, in our conversations, have conversations about shared language and what is racism. Uh, and a black friend or a black wife or husband doesn't uh, negate someone's racist views. Someone in the chat, and I wanted you to speak to this because I thought it's important. Um, across the country right now, there's a fear that many uh, folks on police departments are white supremacists that they actually do harbor racial animus, uh, that they, they do have a, a hatred towards immigrants and, and you know, sort of spelled out even in your language, uh, in your anger. How do you speak to those and several on this call who put in the chat or the Q&A, uh, why do we have the, the white supremacists on police departments? How would you answer that for yourself? First of all, uh, as we go forward, Mr. Curry, can you speak up a little bit? Because I got to keep yeah. getting closer to the computer to understand you. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if we have white supremacists on, on police departments from throughout the country. I really don't. I can say that here in Arlington, I can unequivocally say that we don't. I know the way I live my life. I know the way I've conducted myself professionally on this job. I have never treated somebody differently because of the color of their skin. I've never treated somebody differently because of their socioeconomic socioeconomic status, their mental health status, it, whether they may have a, a, a problem with addiction or not. I've been embracing the principles of procedural justice my whole career. And uh, I know I know what I've been accused of, and, it, and it's simply not true. Um, but the way that I live my life and the way that I conduct myself at work, I live in a very diverse neighborhood. My, I have a diverse group of friends. My, my kids have diverse groups of friends. I've been successful coaching diverse groups of people. Um, again, I've, I've, never, I've never had a complaint for treating somebody unfairly or, or, or with any bias. Um, so interesting you said, I think part of what we're trying to deal with across the country is this view that officers have, and I've never met an officer who said he was racist, and I've never met an officer who said he discriminated. Um, so I think not speaking specifically to you, but the broader issue, we have this issue of, of reconciling why no officer believes they do anything that is uh, discriminatory or racist in their job. But yet so many feel it. And, and I will tell you, as I told you, Lieutenant Pedrini, I grew up in a neighborhood where I saw it all the time. Um, and those same in my city, Boston, police officers uh, would pe beat up uh, kids my age as a teenager, um, steal their drugs, steal their, you know, if they had something stolen, they would steal it from them and then sell it. Um, so there's a there's a. Uh, a reputation uh, in communities across this country of what police officers do. And it's not all police officers, um, but I think we have to reconcile that. Um, I think folks on this call, and this is an important point for you and I to talk about, Lieutenant Pedrini, feel that the statements you made that though may, they may have been targeted at uh, the Gannon or the Chestnut situation were pretty broad. Uh, there were comments that did not seem restricted to that, that you actually criticized uh, procedural justice as one of your comments as though you've said you've been committed to procedural justice. How do you address the folks on this call and those who've been a part of the uh, Consensus Building Institute's in, uh, interviews who feel like having someone who believes these things uh, on the streets in Arlington with a gun and a badge and authority um, to exercise that what is perceived to be racial animus, um, that hatred, how do you speak to them when they're concerned that you did not get terminated, that you're still on the job and your option was restorative justice? There are quite a few people in town, and I don't know what that percentage is, and I think the town manager and others have been trying to, to get a pulse for the community. Some are upset that you're still on the job. How would you, how would you respond to them? 
and their fear? I would certainly never discount their fears. Um, depending on what type of life experience they've had, what, what past experience they've had with members of law enforcement. But the truth is that I've had a pretty good solid career here. Um, and I think that should count for something. Like I said, I've never had a use of force complaint. Prior to this, prior to this incident, I'd only been disciplined one time. Uh, I've been promoted twice. I was promoted the, to sergeant under former Chief Ryan, and I was promoted to lieutenant under Mr. Chapter Lane's administration. In 2015, I was personally selected as the recipient of the Department's Excellence, Excellence in Leadership Award. The only, it's the only award we have that's personally picked by the Chief of Police. I, I have numerous commendations for critical incidents where I was a supervisor, commendations and medals where I was a supervisor and was able to de-escalate critical incidents using minimal force and coming with coming to a safe resolution. I've never, I don't mistreat people. I've ne I don't have a history of mistreating people. I'm one of the few supervisors I've ever heard of who's gotten thank you notes from detainees, apologies from suspects that have assaulted me in the past. Um, those, those are rare in this job, but that's the way I conduct myself. I've, al I've always, since I started here, they didn't call it procedural justice then, but I've always conducted myself in that way. And uh, going Lieutenant. forward, I, excuse me. No, go ahead, go ahead. Going forward, I think I need to be even more empathetic and more understanding of the people I did hurt with these articles and realize how they were so hurt and, and, and what, type, what type of backgrounds they come from. And I, I really need to understand that. Compassion and empathy isn't enough. I think I need a deeper understanding. So I want to make a turn, um, Lieutenant Pedrini, but I want to make this comment before we go forward. And I think for all of the folks who are in trenches trying to deal with uh, police violence and police misconduct across the country who are on this call, um, in, including uh, Zane Crude, who's the president of NAACP, is on the call. There is a belief when we think about the Derek Chauvin in the George Floyd case in Minneapolis or Officer Daniel Pentaleo in the New York case of Eric Garner, the chokehold, or Geronimo Yanez in Minnesota uh, with the shooting of Philando Castile, who was a licensed carrying uh, gun owner and was shot with his family in the car, or Michael Strager in North Charleston, South Carolina. That was the shooting of Walter Scott in the back as he was running away that if you could dig into those officers' writings, their conversations, I, I think people believe that they may say the same things that you said in that article, right? It's a frustration with those people, with immigrants, with immigration, with uh, violent uh, black and brown communities that you know we wanna get home to our families. And then um, how do we identify those police officers when their words and their disciplinary actions result in these horrific deaths that I just talked about. Um, you don't have a, a, apparently, and I don't know your police record. Uh, I can only go by what you just shared. Um, but I think people say your words are pretty weighty. Uh, so your record is one thing, but your words speak volumes. Um, there's an old saying that says, I can't, uh, uh, I can't hear, I can't, I can't hear what you're saying. Oh no, your, your actions, are um, your actions are being outdone by your words. Um, and it's not the exact quote, but I, I ask you that question to say, how can you assure people that you're not one of these officers and that when an incident comes up, even if it didn't happen already, that if you harbor these feelings that it could play out when you have to arrest someone on the street or when you're in a situation and, you, and it's an immigrant uh, that you're dealing with or an African-American man, um, how, how should your uh, fellow residents in Arlington know that you won't act out in the same way? That's a good question. Um, I've grown, I've certainly grown from this. And I, and I expect to continue to grow. I realize that, that the words I wrote matter and my actions matter, but I have grown from this.
I don't I don't know how to assure those people that would have questioned that, other than the fact that my past performance is a good indicator of what I'm going to be doing going forward. Maybe with that, Lieutenant, I want to turn to, uh, and there may be some people on the call who feel like your defensiveness maybe with um, your record, uh, with um, the anger that you were feeling at the time. So I want to give you an opportunity to talk about how much you've grown and, do, and, and progress from the time when you wrote these things uh, two years ago. Can you talk a little bit about the restorative justice process you went through? Um, how you change. You just mentioned that you've grown a lot, but gives people a little bit more context for what you've grown in, what understandings you have, um, how you would um, view those things differently that you wrote in the piece. Um, I, to, when this discipline process was proposed to me, a combination of traditional discipline and then this restorative justice process, I, I thought it would be the best opportunity to help me mend some of the relationships that I had harmed with what I wrote and to help move forward rather than strictly a serious suspension. Um, but as I get feedback on what people are saying, how, how what I wrote hurt them, people that I wasn't considering at the time I wrote it, I wrote those columns, people who feel marginalized, people who feel oppressed, immigrants. I, my father was a son of immigrants. I've never considered myself anti-immigrant. My comments on what was going on at the southern, southern border in 2018 were completely insensitive. And I, and I regret writing them, obviously, and uh, I was wrong to write that. But I have grown. I, I, I'm seeing now, we. Here in Arlington, we've been at the forefront of dealing with mental health crises, dealing with the opiate problem. We were some of the first in the, in the area to be distributing Narcan at the police station, having Narcan on our offices in the field. We've moved beyond that stigma of addiction to where we were recognizing officers for life-saving awards when they saved opiate overdose cases. We were one of the first apartments in the area that, that had a full-time mental health clinician to assist us with our mental health problems here. Um, I'm realizing now, when I get feedback from people from those communities, how seriously I hurt them, how insensitive I was, and how I need to work to, to rebuild that trust and, and, and to mend that harm. I'm gonna read some of the uh pieces in the Q&A, um, uh, Lieutenant Pedrini, because these are some of the questions I would have for you anyway. I think people are struggling to reconcile what you wrote still uh, to what you you say now. I think people are really struggling to figure out how you can uh, make some of the comments, because uh, people tend to believe that what you say is who you are. Um, so one of them says, in past writings, Lieutenant Pedrini wrote, how about that nut who decided to ruin the 4th of July in New York by climbing up the Statue of Liberty just your typical self-absorbed radical whose sole motive is to piss off regular Americans. I know I'm not the only one who is rooting for his for her to fall and land on Kaepernick. Um, what do you think of those words now? Um, you, you know, again, we're Americans. We have a First Amendment uh, right to free speech. Uh, people have our views, as you said earlier. We're not a monolith, monolithic in our views, but. People want to know that you've grown from some of the things you said to understand. I mean, we're all in this, as the uh, town manager, um, Mr. Chapdelaine said, we're in this national reckoning on race. What is your reckoning? What is the, what is the awareness that you've gained in this whole process? With relation to, with relation to that line, uh, that, that commentary, it was over the top. I should have never written it. At the time, it seemed that seemed wild to me that somebody would do that. Looking back on it, it was freedom of expression. Um, I don't think she was ever charged or, or anything. Um, I regret writing that. It, it was definitely it was an over the top commentary uh, that I was trying to make light of a situation, and 
it obviously was inappropriate. Um, so there are some, uh, Lieutenant Pedrini, I'm sure, because uh, this is predictable, that are on the line right now wondering, is he just saying what he needs to say to keep his job? Uh, and and I will I'll be honest and I'll say to the folks on the call, having met with you twice, um, that I did um, I felt uh, some contrition uh, that you do feel bad about the things you wrote, but I'm not sure the depth that you feel bad. How do you how do you respond to those who feel like uh, this is just a a move to save your job? I have grown a lot over the last. 17 months since I came back to work. This has been a very difficult journey. It's gonna be a journey that continues. I'm remorseful for what I wrote. I realize now, and I'm certainly aware of the hurt I caused, the harm I caused, the work I have to do going forward to re to reestablish trust between the community and myself and the community and the department. I'm embarrassed. My, I had a pretty good reputation as a police officer. That reputation is certainly suffering right now. And I got to do a lot of work to get it back. Um, my wife and my children have seen a lot of ugly things. It's embarrassing. My mother, who's a 51 year resident here with an impeccable reputation as an early childhood, as an early childhood education professional a devout woman of faith. Her ca her character is being questioned because of what I wrote. And it's all my fault. I I have some deep contrition and regret and remorse as to what I did. Um, I want to touch on two quick things because I know we're moving on in time and we want to go to the, to the panel as well. So I want to capture Greg's comment and then I want to get someone else who had it online. But um, you said earlier there's a need for reform in your profession. Uh, can you talk a bit about what reform you now realize is needed in law enforcement? Uh, and what would you do personally within the Arlington Police Department to follow through on that reform? Thank you, Greg. Um, I think technology is something that's important. Maybe body cameras, things like that. Dashboard cameras that would uh, increase accountability, increase veracity when it came to uh, differing sides of the story. Um, some use of force reforms here in the Commonwealth. We don't. We're not to taught chokeholds. That's a, a deadly force tool of opportunity in the absolute fight for your life before a chokehold would ever be warranted. Um, that's in the pending legislation right now. And I think as long as there was some due process protections, I think most reasonable offices are amenable to a licensing slash certification process. Um, I want to go to another question, uh, Lieutenant Pedrini. Uh, here's another question. I hear that you are sorry for the hurt and fear caused by your writings. And I hear you believe you were careless and crude. What I do not hear is that you acknowledge and now disavow the core beliefs that drive your remarks, especially the attitudes about immigrants, minorities, and progressive activists working for racial justice. What can you tell me or this uh, group of folks on the call about the inner beliefs behind your words then and now? Has your heart changed or do you just regret the damage your words have done? I think, I think most definitely I've grown as a man. I mean, I'm 51 now, I expect to grow and learn for the rest of my life, but it's been two years Soci things in society has changed not not completely for the better but i'm certainly more open-minded than i was two years ago and uh with with all the things that have happened since memorial day weekend in the country i i can definitely say that i've changed and, and that my viewpoints towards certain things have changed so i want to acknowledge and show some um 
some diversity and sort of the feedback on this call. So Katina Silberman had a comment. She said, I'm a longtime men member of the UU or Universalist Unitarian Church in town. This seems like a real and honest conversation. I'm ready to forgive Lieutenant Pedrini for his mistake and move forward. He seems like a good man to me, and I believe he has learned from this. I think, Lieutenant Pedrini, you will see a, a wide variation in views. Uh, you'll have some officers on here and others uh, who feel like uh, you are uh, uh, truly uh, remorseful for what you did. You have others in the chat, and I'm sure you can see some of the conversation of feeling like um, you were defensive and that uh, you're not truly understanding or, or explaining those underlying issues. I think people are having a hard time believing that you still don't believe the same thing about immigrants, right? In this toxic political environment we're in right now, where people are talking about MS-13, MS-13, like every Latino coming into this country is a member of MS-13, or every uh, guy with a hoodie on and baggy jeans is a thug. Uh, and I think people are uh, doubtful that you could write the hurtful things that you wrote in that piece and then on a dime, right? Really in a year or two, change that. I think maybe I'll just give you another chance to, to talk about the evolution of your thinking on these issues, um, not just being remorseful, but what have you read? Uh, what are you reading right now? Who are you, who are you talking to? How are you deconstructing um, the, the beliefs that uh, caused you to write that piece? I'm not reading anything in particular, but I'm 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 reading news stories and and, and commentary and and things that have especially happened since the George Floyd incident, and more and more people with backgrounds and different lived experiences in dealing with the police, dealing with. societal issues that are different from the background I come from, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to realize now how deeply hurtful my words were to certain people. I want to acknowledge just, uh, and I know we're going to get to the panel in a second, but I want to acknowledge another comment um, uh, in the chat and a question. I feel I feel less safe in my community, this person writes, knowing you are part of Arlington Police Department. Please tell us what you are doing personally, professionally, and politically to practice anti-racism. Be specific about actions, books, understanding, especially in the context of your own privilege and power, right? We, we're having this conversation now, Lieutenant Pedrini, about privilege and, and white privilege. And, and you heard even our president say that was drinking the Kool-Aid, right? I think people want to know whether you believe there is such a thing as privilege and that power. What are your specific plans or ideas to implement police reforms as a way to repair distrust of police in this town? And of course, Lieutenant Virginia, you don't own all of that, right? That is um, uh, the, the Arlington Police Department uh, led by uh, the work of uh, the Arlington town manager and many others that are in this work. But I, pe people want to hear your thoughts. What do you think is necessary and what do you think you're doing to contribute to that work of, of um, fighting uh, anti-racism going forward? I, I think I'm leading by example in the things that I'm doing. Where it, we, we are firm believers in, in the, the 21st century, the principles of 21st century p policing. You know, we, we're all about trust and legitimacy and, that, and that's the reason we're here right now is to reestablish trust and our uh, and our legitimacy that's the way we take care of business here we don't we're a department that gets very very few use of force complaints complaints about bias or or, or racist behavior or, or even rudeness we've we're at the forefront when it comes to progressive policies the oversight of our policies is constant you know after the George Floyd incident, Chief Flaherty worked with both unions and we we instituted the um, the duty to act in a situation of excessive force where supervisors and, and rank and file officers alike are now required with a duty to intervene 
when when they see uh, what they would perceive as excessive force. We're using technology and social media to strengthen our ties and our relationships with the community. Um, we've been practicing community policing and crime reduction strategies with different neighborhood groups and different stakeholders in the community for my whole career. I mean, just recently, I know, I mean, this is just one community policing initiative I was involved with and it involved people from all, every background in the community was that the traffic unit, the office that I run in coordination with the Department of Public Works put together the community policing home run of the summer when we did the Arlington High senior caravan. That was, that was done to rave reviews. And, and I think if you ask anybody who was there, who saw me and the, the rest of the members of the department in action, they would certainly feel safe. We didn't have anybody come up to us or anybody complain and say that because I was a part of it, they felt unsafe. I mean, that was, that was Rick Pedrini. That was Rick Pedrini at work, making wow. sure everything ran smoothly, celebrating with these graduates, no matter what their background was. Um, so I wanted to jump in there, Lieutenant Pedrini, because I want to excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Curry, I can hardly hear you. Yeah, yeah, I want to close this piece out, but I want to just acknowledge some other comments. So I think people are feeling like you speak well to uh, the work that's being done broadly, but people want to hear more about what you're doing, right? People want to have a sense for, based on those comments, um, what you're doing to make a difference in the Arlington Police Department, uh, in your community, uh, and they want to see that play out. So I think wherever you're responding to that question, right, it's important you speak specifics around what you're doing. Someone else said, um, asked if you would be willing uh, to join a white fragility learning group or something that speaks to active anti-racism education. Um, and I'm going to say this, and you and I have had similar conversations. Um, this stuff doesn't go away, right? The comments that you put into that article um, require that there's some education, right? You don't you don't understand more about um, sexism by just deciding to appreciate women, right? It takes understanding how sexism manifests in society. You don't understand racism unless you read about it and understand the history of this country and policing in this country. So I think it's important um, as someone chimed in with that, what are you willing to do? You know, what are you willing to read, uh, engage in, and are you, right? Because I think people want to know that you didn't just uh, wake up one day and, and uh, had an epiphany, and then you realize that that wasn't good. The town of Arlington and all those others that are listening want to know what you're vested in to change the thinking behind those words. Like I said in my, in my opening statement, I'm amenable and, and I look forward to participating in any police race, anything to do with policing and, and uh, racism and 21st century policing going forward. Anything that I can contribute to or learn from. Just like I volunteered to go to a, a, several different trainings since I've been back on implicit bias, on um, procedural justice, on repairing and, and rebuilding community relations. I'm, I'm, I'm open to anything. Thank you, Lieutenant. I, did, I want to close it out with this last piece. Just talk very quickly to restorative justice, uh, your view on what you went through, the process. You just mentioned a few things, but you went through much more than that uh, as a part of the RJ process. Speak to it, and then we'll go to the panel. I just want to acknowledge um, uh, Fajina, Jean, who said that she would record books for you to help with your education in this process. I want to acknowledge some police officers who are on the call, uh, who are in the chat and, and even texting me, like Mark Conrad, a former state police officer, who's on the line as well. Many people uh, are paying attention to what you say and what you do in this moment, uh, uh, Lieutenant Pedrini. So just sw speak quickly, since we start a little bit behind, I want to give you a second to speak to restorative justice. Does it work? How, how did it evolve your thinking? And uh, do you think that there's more work to do? Um, I think it was one of the hottest things I've ever done. I think it was in the long run, 
COVID and um, forces beyond our control kind of delayed this to this point where, where it's so far along, um, which is unfortunate. I would have rather have done this community meeting when it was fresh, when it was, when it, I think it was supposed to be last May, May of 19. But it was definitely one of the most difficult things I've ever done. Um, it probably would have been a lot easier to take a heavier suspension and uh, just come back to work without having to have much accountability, without having to go through all this. But I think I'm better for it. I think I've grown. I think I've learned a lot. And uh, it's certainly a legitimate process. It is most certainly a legitimate process. So I wanna, I wanna close it out there because I know we used quite a bit of time for our conversation, Lieutenant Virginia. So I wanna thank you for this conversation and the two previous ones we've had. I wanna challenge you though, before we go to the panel, um, that this is a process that should not stick to, it should end. Uh, people are in the chat and they wanna know that you've changed and that your thinking has changed. And you don't get that unless you read some stuff, unless you engage people who are experts in these areas, uh, unless you know American history. Um, and I'm, I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to share some stuff with you myself um, that I want you to take a look at and read. Uh, and and I, I've already extended this to you. You can call me anytime and we can have these conversations. Commissioner Gross in Boston, Boston Police Commissioner, our friends, we engage and we don't always agree. Uh, Mark Conrad, who's a state police officer, is on the, on the line and, and he and I engage on these issues all the time. Uh, please use folks like myself to engage in these critical conversations about race, about gender, about sexual orientation, around uh, 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 discrimination uh, at large, um, and even um, how it manifests itself in law enforcement. So I'm gonna extend that to you before we go to uh, the group conversation. Uh, there is a lot here. So as a transition to the reaction panel, um, we'll open up and introduce everybody quickly. Uh, we're calling on people when we go into the discussion. So I'm gonna transition to this uh, discussion and ask the folks in Arlington to help me out. Um, uh, Alinsa, Drake, Scott, Greg, Susan, David, Dora Lee, Fajina, Zane, uh, all folks that are on the line right now. Thank you all for uh, sticking around uh, and being part of this conversation. Uh, this is where we get to, to expand this conversation to kind of what your thinking is based on what you heard. Uh, so I want to appreciate you all being here. And I just want to ask you, you know, Go ahead and chime in. What, what did you think about uh, Lieutenant Pedrini's apology, uh, which was live instead of recorded? And what did you think about the conversation? Who wants to chime in first? I'll hop in. Um, hey, so David. First, um, hi, so I'm David Valdez. Um, I am uh, the son of a Cuban-American uh, refugee. Uh, parent to an African-American child uh, here in Arlington uh, and a gay man. Um, so I've had lots of different pieces of the American experience, but the pieces of my American experience also include the fact that um, I grew up in a small town um, where uh, the, the local police were very important to us. Um, the police chief was a member of my church and a family friend. And in the next town, my uncle was head of the was the police chief and he went on to become the head of the police chiefs for the main state uh, chiefs association and he was somebody who really set a model uh, for us of what good policing looks like so I come I come into this um, conversation from a couple of directions at once uh, both as a person of color and a parent of a child of a different color um, but also as somebody with um, law enforcement in their family and I just want to reflect some of the things that I heard the repeated use of the word insensitivity, right, that it was insensitive, um, really landed on my ear because insensitivity focuses on the feelings of the recipient. It puts the weight on the recipient um, as opposed to the action on the speaker. Um, it's different, you know, when you frame it as I harmed you with threats of violence or I harmed you with my language. Right. So I kept hearing insensitivity, which is true. Absolutely. But that's part of what I think, you know, I, I feel like, you know, uh, Rick, that you're wrestling with. Um, and that's a, a, bit, a really big thing to be wrestling with. Um, 
But the other piece is you talk about past performance as an indicator of the future going forward. And that's the thing that really I, I keep turning around. I appreciate the good things that you have done. If you have detainees thanking you for their interactions with you, that's wonderful. I love that the, that the Arlington Police Department has the mental health piece. You've got the new duty to act. But if your past performance is an indicator of the future, your writings are only two years old and your writings are part of your past performance. And so the thing that I keep wrestling with as I listen to you is, so in a moment of stress or pressure going forward now, are we to take that your past performance will be an indicator of your future performance then, right? So in those moments of stress, are you going to turn to thoughts of violence? Are you going to have those feelings about immigrants? At, as a child and of immigrants and half of my family being refugees, that analogy of making people who come to the border, equating them with kamikaze bombers, really just chilled me. So I guess what I'm saying is I know you're doing all this work, which is powerful and, I'm, and I appreciate. Um, but I think the thing that I'm hoping that you do going forward is to really police your heart and to police your thoughts and to say, um, do those things still live in me that meet violence, that the violence response, that notion of uh, immigrants as a threat to be killed, to be sh shot at, um, police that as Dude, well. Because you can just wrap I'm, it up. I want to get to someone else, but I appreciate all your all right. comments. Yeah, I'll Thank do. you, David. And Rick, feel free to chime in. I know you responded to quite a bit already. Uh, if you want to respond to David, please feel free to. Um, other comments and questions? Uh, other people want to jump in? I can jump in, Michael. Yeah, hey, Zay. Hey, thanks for having me, Michael. Thanks for having me, everyone. My name is Zane Crute. I'm the president of the Mystic Valley area branch of the NWCP, so I work close, uh, close with Michael all the time. So, uh, Lieutenant Pedrini, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know this has been a huge, huge story for the town of Arlington. And a lot of people on the line are wondering, do they believe your apology? Do they forgive you? Candidly, in my opinion, I just want to say, I don't really think it matters, to be honest. Rick, you're just one, you're just one person. You are not the problem of all 900 thousand police officers in America. We want to work towards a solution. So that being said, your comments are an illustration of the culture in policing overall. The system's just much, much bigger than just you in Arlington or in Massachusetts or an entire United States. So thankfully, George Floyd or Breonna Taylor didn't come as a result of your comments. It doesn't always happen, thank God, but this culture is what creates situations like this that happen. Besides the pending legislation that hopefully addresses some of the system issues, uh, Lieutenant Pedrini, what do you think we can do to address the culture? People are still holding Blue Lives Matter rallies in Arlington. People still believe being anti-police brutality is anti-police. People still believe there's a war going on against the police due to a lot of talk radio, publications such as your publications, Fox News and such or whatever. So what do you think is a viable solution to change the culture and overall policing? And how are you going to be part of the solution if you want people in the town of Arlington to, you know, forgive you? Excellent question, Zane. Um, Lieutenant Pedrini, I'm going to ask you to respond to that because I think it's a critical one about culture. Um, how do we change the culture in policing if you identify it as a problem? Culture, the culture in, the poli in, in, in policing needs to be changed to that. We need to realize that, and this principle is as old as policing itself, is that we're, po we're just as much part of the community as the community is a part of us. Now, I would certainly love to sit down with any members of BLM or other community groups and talk to them one-on-one -on -one and get to really know each other, just like I was able to talk to Michael. And, and, that, and like I plan on continuing a relationship talking to Michael. But what I did work at, at that protest and the counter protest on that Thursday night. And there was a lot of animosity towards the police from, from the counter protesters. And, and uh, it was pretty vile and hurtful and uh, ugly. No, not all of it, not all of it, but there was a segment of that, of that group that was 
not so well behaved and not and not so pro police that's for sure and, and i'm gonna say, gonna say that and i'll go to you next susan but i zane i'm sure would say this if he was not on mute um uh to Zane's question though, right, is if we acknowledge that there's been uh, a culture in policing that produces the George Floyd more murders, and quite frankly, you know, and I would challenge this notion that there's only a few bad apples. And I've said this to mayors and others, that I don't know if we know how many bad apples there are, because quite frankly, if someone racially profiles me, they're a bad apple, and I get racially profiled all the time. Uh, if you come into communities of color or in a community that is not a community of color, but you stop, disrespect residents of color or LGBTQ, or you treat women disrespectfully, you're a bad cop to me. Now, if anyone can quantify that and tell me how many cops that is, that's a conversation to be had. But I think that's the culture Zane is talking about, that when you can get away with that behavior, eventually, and you have deference. So we have so much deference to law enforcement that you do God's work. So since you do God's work, no one's checking you, no one's holding you accountable, and then when you're held accountable, you're defensive. So I think that culture that Zane's talking to is what we're hoping uh, that you and many other officers around across the country. Before you go to Susan, I will mention that uh, I just got a message from, um, I mentioned Mark Conrad. He's offering to have you sit with officers of color across the state to have a conversation about what they see in law enforcement. So I think that would be an interesting conversation for you, uh, Lieutenant Padrini to sit with the Massachusetts Association of Minority Law Enforcement Officers, as well as Mark Conrad, and have a conversation among your brothers and sisters as to what they think about uh, racial discrimination uh, and, and anti-racism uh, work within the police department. Susan. Um, I just wanna offer some observations. Um, the, the Back the Blue rally in Arlington, I attended with my daughters, they wanted to go. And I was stunned at the rude, vile and disgusting behavior of people who were there for the Back the Blue side. Um, flipping, flipping off my daughters, um, gross, gross behavior. And I agree utterly with Zane, it's irrelevant where you are, Rick, in your evolution. Um, this is larger than you. Um, but it's also about the town. And I, I think, you know, the questions about what have you done? What, you know, how have you evolved? What have you read? I think the fact that your sister-in-law organized that Back the Blue rally, um, she's not an Arlington resident, and it was vicious. The, um, the Facebook event was all about language, about how equating racial justice with anti-police. Um, I don't understand that. I don't understand that mentality. Um, I don't understand why law enforcement are so triggered and triggered so easily by the phrase Black Lives Matter. Um, just wanna move on to, a, and if you have any response, please respond. But just a couple of other um, observations. Um, a couple of times, many times during your remarks this evening, you talked about people who feel marginalized and feel oppressed. It's not a feeling. People are marginalized. People are oppressed. Um, friend of mine is a transgender woman. And there's something about law enforcement that I don't under understand, but corrections, people who work in the Department of Corrections and people who have transgender women in their custody um, this is a fairly common thing, and I don't understand why uh, law enforcement who has a transgender woman in custody like to make her take her clothes off, put her arms up, and have her jump up and down in the air. Uh, air, air. I have heard this story from many transgender women. Um, Boston police, you look confused when I said that. They had to pay a settlement in 2015 or 16 for this behavior. A colleague of mine who was a plaintiff in the lawsuit that permits transgender women who are incarcerated in Massachusetts not to be housed in a male prison, that also happened to her. Um, so people aren't feeling marginalized, they aren't feeling oppressed, they are marginalized, they are oppressed. My oldest daughter is a senior, she participated in that car rally, it was fantastic. I want you to know about my mindset before I went out to that rally. Um, my daughter decorated her car 
and she spray painted BLM and Black Lives Matter all over the car. And it made me really uncomfortable um, because my driver's side mirror is broken. And I thought some cop is going to get pissed off seeing the BLM stuff and they're going to pull me over. And I was stunned that we weren't pulled over. And I was so gratified when I got to that rally and saw that the majority of cars were similarly decorated with Black Lives Matter all over their cars in BLM. And I loved it. Um, so just FYI. Susan, thank you. Uh, yep. Thank you. I, I want to go to Scott next. Go ahead, Scott. Thank you, Michael. Great work uh, today. And thank you, Rick, for the apology. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an Arlington resident and a police lieutenant of the town of Bedford. I, I've known Rick uh, for, for many years. Um, over the past few years, I, I had an opportunity to, you know, I got the Sentinel in the mail, as he, as he indicated. And my initial reaction was that this wasn't the person I knew over the years. Uh, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know Rick that way. But to be honest, I saw several of the writings and the editorials that that, that went public, and I knew um, I knew that he was using dehumanizing language and violent images. Um, by remaining silent and on the sidelines, as a police officer, I became complicit in this view of policing. So, you know, uh, there's a there's another uh, side to this that. You know, as officers, and Rick kind of hit on it a little earlier. We we have an we have an obligation to the community. We have an obligation to each other uh, to call out this kind of behavior. So, um, I, I you know I did find his essays were very divisive and even racist. The IACP and the Mass Chiefs all all issued retractions, stating that the, these views were not uh, they weren't defensible and and they didn't represent the values of the law enforcement profession. So in my 33 years of law enforcement, I do not believe that most uh, police officers feel this way or espouse these extreme views uh, of the communities they serve. Um, I did have an opportunity to participate in the uh, restorative justice circle. And, um, you know, I, I felt that uh, you, you listened and responded to what the community members told you about our experiences and how your essays affected uh, us personally. Um, and I heard regret about the pain that you caused. So I believe that regret was real. Uh, but one of the, the, the big takeaways I'd, I'd like to see is, is, is would you be willing to issue a letter of retraction and apology in the Sentinel disavowing what you wrote and expressing that regret for its impact on the community and on other police officers? An apology sent to to Arlington um, uh, to the Arlington residents was good, but I think in the, in the leadership role that you have, I mean, would you be willing to also put yourself out there to the to the police community and disavow what you uh, what you wrote? Go ahead, Lieutenant Pedrini. I'll go to you on that question. I believe that was already done uh, in November of 2018, um, and the. The, Sent the Sentinel is not a um, print publication anymore, so I, I don't I don't really think that that is a reality. But I will certainly talk to the leadership about that. And and I want to go back to something Susan said because I don't want folks that are on this call tonight to lose sight of this. And Zane, uh, being an NAACP president, would attest to this. Uh, it is not just about law enforcement that are policing on our streets. It is about the Department of Corrections. It is about the abuses across law enforcement. So I have these conversations with sheriffs like Sheriff Steve Tompkins. He and I have this conversation all the time. I've been into Walpole uh, and uh, the other prisons when there have been complaints about police abuse, law enforcement abuse of prisoners. We cannot let this be about one police officer in Arlington. This is a bigger conversation about uh, law enforcement in general. So I just want, Susan, I didn't want to to leave that alone because what you shared with us anecdotally is um, disturbing. Uh, and we should be responding to those cases as well. Um, others, Greg, uh, Vegina, anybody else want to jump in here? Um, I can jump in. Go ahead, Vegina. Oh, let me introduce myself first. So I am an Arlington resident for the past 12 years, um, Arlington High School 2019 graduate, and I'm currently in college in Boston and still resident in Arlington. Um, first, I just want to say, um, Thank you for the apology and coming out and publicly apologizing. But then I also want to say that part of your apology, I did not believe that it was sincere and that you meant it. Um, you were asked over and over, what are you doing to change 
how you behave in 2018. And all you kept saying was that you attended workshops, you did this, but you never mentioned how um, you even thought about picking up a book to read about the history, to read about the racial tension that's going on in America. Because I personally believe that you can attend all those workshops. Those are people telling you what you should believe in and what you should do. You're not gonna learn or learn from your mistakes to do better until you pick up something that you you want to read that you want to do. So I do believe moving forward for you to actually change your mindset and make people to start believing, you need to start educating yourself. You can't keep getting educated, getting educated, and you're not gonna learn anything until you actually educate yourself and take the initiative to educate yourself. So I think by starting to read some books, and I do have a few recommendations of books that you could read that will help educate you on the history of America, the history of the racial tension in America, and so forth. Thank you, Virginia. And uh, uh, Lieutenant, very important, her message to you, because I think that's what you're hearing a lot in the chat, uh, is that you do some, some work yourself beyond the workshops, beyond RJ, um, that this is about transformation for you. Uh, and that uh, regaining the public trust requires that you do some individual work uh, yourself beyond what the town of Arlington is requiring you to do as a part of keeping your job. Thank you, Fajina. Uh, Greg, anyone else have, I've missed so far that want to chime in? Hi, Lori? this is Drake. Uh, Drake? Can you hear me? Hi. Um, I have an observation to make and then a question that goes back to the, the writings that, that started this whole thing. Um, my name is Drake. I've been on the Human Rights Commission in Arlington since last November. So after the writing happened, so I've been catching up on it. But um, one, th I think one of the reasons this scares people so much is because, you know, if a businessman says something bad, people don't worry that all businessmen are automatically bad, right? But the police. Um, and other groups refer to themselves as the men and women in uniform. And the word uniform and, and the uniform itself is meant to make them appear the same, right? Every police officer is expected to meet a very high standard. And so any police behavior that doesn't meet that standard scares people into thinking that all police are the same. Therefore, they will all not meet that standard. So that's why writings from police are more scary than writings from maybe any other category of or vocation, right? I think that's something to understand. And so my question goes back to the writing, which is I totally understand being angry about um, and, and just being totally distraught about police officers being killed and ambushed. And the, the disconnect for me is why that led to writing against social justice warriors, people of color, immigrants, and those categories. And my question is, I think it's easy for everyone to understand that those writings were insensitive. But my question is, do you believe those writings were fundamentally incorrect? Or do you and other police feel that social justice warriors are in any part responsible for the ambush killings of police? No, I don't think that. I, I don't. Again, when I when I wrote that, and I have that language in front of me, um, that was strictly in relation to the Chesna murder. Officer Chesna, Sergeant Chesna, didn't have the opportunity to disengage. He he didn't have the he didn't have the opportunity to to de-escalate. He didn't have the opportunity to. to engage that sus that that man with the rock to engage him in a conversation that was a split second situation with it was a deadly force situation sergeant chesna unfortunately lost that battle that deadly force battle and and that's that's the only time i mentioned i shouldn't have i obviously i shouldn't have lumped social justice warriors and those other things into that paragraph. Um, and, and, you know, obviously it, 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 it was bad form and I regret it. Okay. 
I, the, 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 the second thing I just wanted to say is I wanted, while I have a chance to thank all the people who worked really hard on putting this together, I feel that any step, no matter how small, in the right direction is absolutely worth taking. And we should never pass on something when it's going in the right direction. So I think um, everyone who even showed up took a step in the right direction. And so to everyone who showed up, uh, my thanks. Thank you for that, Drake. Before I go back to you, Susan, I want to just recognize Dora Lee. You know, I'm a huge proponent of young people and that young people need to be in this conversation because quite frankly, uh, Lieutenant Pedrini, um, your, your, your language that you use terrifies me, but I'm not surprised because I do civil rights work. Uh, and those of us who do civil rights work see this stuff all the time. It comes from teachers, it comes from police officers, it comes from judges, attorneys like I am. Uh, we see it and we see that, that those beliefs manifest itself in the decisions that people make, uh, who gets sentenced, uh, who gets good at uh, advanced classes, and quite frankly, uh, who gets protected and served. Um, but I wanted to acknowledge uh, Dora Lee because she's young, and we're trying to do this work of correcting this stuff for her, quite frankly. Uh, she's a high school student at Arlington High and a member of the high school's Black Student Union. So Dora Lee, can you give us a little wave? And if you want to chime in, this is your moment. I call it double yeah, dutch. You can, you can jump in on the double dutch right now. Yeah, I'll chime in. Um, just want to say that I'm actually a graduate of Arlington High oh, School. Oh, good. Kind of Congratulations. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and I was part of the Black Student Union. Fajina is actually one of the founders of the Black Student Union. I'm also a student activist within Arlington. Been here for approximately about four years and the, one of the head organizers of Activate Arlington protests that happened in June, if any of you guys were there. So that's me. Um, so, Lieutenant, so one thing that Drake said that I actually kind of resonated with and really made sense to me is the uniform aspect where, you know, you would think that all cops are the same because they wear that uniform. What I want to say to you is that you are a lieutenant and you have that position of power, right? When you have power, what you say automatically, it, people are now like trying to, they, they hear you more when you have power, if that makes sense, right? You have the president, if the president were to say something that was derogatory towards black people or to women or to LGBTQ, right? You would listen to him more because he's president. He has that power, right? As a lieutenant, you have that power, right? So you have other officers below you who are looking up to you, right? So that when they see the lieutenant, right? They see that man in power, now talking and you know saying disrespectful things towards immigrants towards um uh, people of color towards whatever the case might be right that's an issue because now you have people who are now looking up at you seeing you disrespect other people as a lieutenant having that power right so now they think that they can do it the same way they can do the same exact things because the person in power is doing it I want to like I hope that really makes sense to you know to you understanding the power that you have as a white male within Arlington and as a lieutenant of a police force right power right the the um racism is white privilege plus power right a lot of people have their different um you know definition of it Thank but that's you. mine right it's power plus white privilege um plus um yeah like sorry I'm I'm losing I'm losing my thought right Excellent. but one thing you mentioned one thing, that you, one thing that you mentioned today, just hearing, because I haven't, you know, I've been around in the conversation with the Padrini, Padrini issue, however, you know, still in school, so trying to focus on that. Um, so today is really the time where I really start to understand what is actually going on. So I kind of like did my own research and everything. One thing that you kept mentioning today is that two years ago and after, with, the, with the whole situation, that's when you start to kind of open up to other people's backgrounds, to other people's encounters with police, with other people's society, um, their views on society, et cetera, right? And you mentioned that you're 51 at this moment. Two years ago, you know, you were 49. You should not be 49 years old, lieutenant, now realizing that other people have backgrounds with police, right? You shouldn't be having a, such a successful career with, with yourself and now only realizing that other people have different backgrounds, right? That other people think differently than you. It shouldn't have been that incident that made you realize that other people think differently, that other people could be hurt with the words that you say, right? One thing that have, people have been throwing around in this conversation is trust. Okay, I've done, I, I, take, I took criminal justice in school and I understand that 
poli the police force is supposed to have trust with its community because that's how reporting goes up. That's how you can make a community safer. Okay, trust, the whole word trust is being, you know, thrown around. If you don't even know who's within your community, because a lot of people, like, especially black people within Arlington, I got, and I can say this right now as a black person within Arlington, trusting a police force that is, like, at least 90% white, you know, we're not necessarily going to trust that. So when you say that, you know, we have uh, people who are not, we don't have that many complaints, et cetera, right? Maybe people are just not complaining because they don't trust the police force, right? Maybe people are not speaking up because they don't think that their voice matters in that sense. And I don't want to take too long, but the word trust, like people have said, you know, within this conversation that has trust has been dismantled. Right, it has been discredited, but was it ever there for all community residents within Arlington? Right, was it ever there? To did you really understand the people that live within Arlington? Right, because you explained that it was only two years ago that you had, you know, that kind of aha moment that there's different people, like different people have different values, different people believe different things. So if it was only two years ago that you realized that, what happened to the your entire life being a police officer? Right, building that trust with the people that live within Arlington, because it wasn't two years ago that Black people arrived in Arlington, right? It wasn't two years ago that women arrived in Arlington. It wasn't two years ago that now all of a sudden, you know, we you see diversity within Arlington, right? It's it's been something that has been growing. And as a police officer, police officer, and as a lieutenant, right, you have to realize your power in the situation, right? And building that trust with your residents since day one, not not after you know a situation happens. Right, not after, but before that, because a lot of people, especially in this situation right now, they're only saying Black Lives Matter because now they're realizing it with the George Floyd death. It should have been a conversation that was had already started before the Black Lives Matter situation, right? We need to have these conversations before the bad things even happen. That's what makes it really credible. That's what makes it, we can have change from that because a lot of people, you know, we cannot keep starting the conversations when bad things happen, when we make mistakes. And mistakes need to be prevented with education, like Regina was saying, educate yourself before you make a mistake, right? That's what a lieutenant should do. That's what someone in power should do to kind of um, empower and educate the people below them. Thank you. So Dora Lee, you need to provide a training because you are no joke. Um, you, you know, you dropped a lot of gems. I see fake Regina uh, bigging you up on the screen because uh, I'm not joking when I tell you much of what you covered in, in your remarks to Lieutenant Pedrini, all of us need to hear, right? The responsibility we have when we're in, a, in positions of authority, uh, a definition of racism so people can't say I'm not racist, but they don't know what it is, right? I think prejudice plus power. So if you're on this call and you're a man and you don't think you have male privilege, you don't know what sexism is. You don't know what that privilege, privilege means. Privilege doesn't mean you have money and power and that you didn't grow up on welfare. It means you benefit from your difference in ways that others don't. So I think, you know, you dropped a lot of gems, Dora Lee, so I need to get you on a circuit so you can share your perspective with others. Susan, go ahead. Um, just echo everything you said about Dora Lee. Um, uh, something Drake said um, reminded me of this. Michael, I wanna thank you for how you opened up with um, just the, the incident in Los Angeles where two police deputies were ambushed. It was horrific. It was absolutely horrific. Um, and Rick, you talked quite a bit about how angry and upset you were and emotional you were at the deaths of law enforcement <clears throat> in Massachusetts, which you know may have prompted those essays or not. Um, can you answer a question for me? What is it about police officers that they cannot understand um, the fear held mostly by black men leaving their house and what might happen to them if they have an encounter with a cop. Like, um, you know, you talked about, you talked quite eloquently about the, the police officer, I forgive me, I can't remember his name, who was just, you know, killed while serving a warrant on a Sunday morning. Um, we could fill reams of the names of black men and women who have been killed by police officers just going about their business, going about their daily lives. How come police officers never speak up when these things happen? And how come um, I did not get at all any sense from you whatsoever 
that you equate the two. And nobody shares the deaths of police officers. Um, I think police officers sometimes share the deaths of uh, black people, black men. Thank you, Susan. Lieutenant? I think the the actions of the officers in Minneapolis were universally condemned at the time back in at the end of May by police officers and police leaders from throughout the country. Um, I can't, un, I have no firsthand knowledge of being a person of color being pulled over by the police. So I can't speak to that because that's not my life experience. I could imagine, actually, I, I don't know if I can imagine and what a what a young black male feels like when he leaves the, when he leaves the house, I, I really can't I can't answer to that. I can only try and maybe learn through dialogue, through friends, through colleagues, and uh, but I can't answer that. But the the, the murders and the police actions that took place this summer, um, the 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 deaths of 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 those men were universally condemned. So um, to Susan's question, I just want to clarify something. So I think what we see across the country is that law enforcement typically doesn't condemn those actions until their videos and it's perfectly clear, right? Because I think I use the term of uh, gaslighting that oftentimes when we see these videos, they tell us, well, he was moving or it was a drug house or um, the, the person ultimately, the argument is deserves what happened to them, right? Even the mentally ill, um, if you're in the wrong place, wrong time, you didn't comply, um, that's not a, um, a capital punishment of the offense, right? And we have to start, to Susan's point, we need to hear the empathy and recognition when the system is not working from law enforcement. I think it's Susan's point too. Uh, I used to call Commissioner Evans when he was commissioner of Boston Police and challenge him. And he would respond, we need to hear you on Michael Brown. We need to hear you on George Floyd. And I think we're seeing more of that, right? Because there tends to be uh, a brotherhood that exists where you, where officers can't criticize other officers unless it's blatantly clear, right? George Floyd was blatantly clear. Eight minutes and 46 seconds with someone's knee on your neck. If you've ever sat still for eight minutes and 46 seconds by minute number th three, Scott, there's no question it was murder. By minute number six, it, you'd be a hate-filled person to not know that's murder. So that was pretty clear, uh, Lieutenant Pedrini, but there's a whole bunch of other cases that don't even result in murder in the communities that I come from, in the communities across this country that are still police misconduct and violence. And I, and I hope that you and this example can start to recognize that there's a problem and then we can have a conversation. Last but not least, I want to go to Greg, but I want to make sure I address this. For any officer on the line who says, well, why are they marching in the street on police violence, but not on black and black violence? It's a horrible equivalent. <laughs> when citizens kill each other, white citizens kill white citizens, proximity, black citizens kill black citizens, Latinx folks in their own communities will commit violence. We have a problem in this country of violence, absolutely. But it is, I cannot walk in the street tomorrow, and I've done it many times, on black on black violence, unless we change the social determinants of violence, the poverty, the bad schools, the internalized racism, when you think that you can't become a doctor or a lawyer, the kind of circumstances that create violence in our neighborhood that the Irish saw when they were poor and being discriminated against, the Italians saw, and they didn't snitch either, um, we need to have those kind of conversations so we're not demonizing the victims of these communities and understanding that it is a different thing when you get a badge and a gun and you get charged with protecting and serving and you betray that trust. That is not the same as citizen X killing citizens Y. It's a very horrible example. Greg, you next. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, my name is Greg Christiana. I'm a co-chair of Envision Arlington Standing Committee uh, and I'm a town meeting member. Um, and I, I'd like to build on the points that uh, a lot of other pan panelists have already uh, raised. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I, I totally agree with Zane uh, about the apology. Apologies are nice, uh, but they're not action. 
right? So it, it doesn't move the needle either way, uh, whether it's authentic or sincere or not, uh, at least in my mind. And the needle we need to move, I think like Dora Lee talked about, is trust, right, between the, the police department and, and the community. And I mean, I personally can only see basically like three ways out of this that can get the town on a path toward like kind of healing and like a sense of, of safety. Um, um, and you, I mean, one is, I mean, you could be fired from the force, um, uh, which the town manager has explained in the past why he hasn't cho chosen that path, whether, whether we agree with that or not. Um, there's, you know, you could just, uh, you, you could just walk away and let the town heal in your absence. Um, and third, you, you, you could use your unique position, uh, uh, in, in all this to be a champion of change and, uh, you know, like calling out hate, hateful words and actions uh, within the department, like Scott mentioned, uh, uh, using your authority that, that you have within the de department and the seniority that you have as a lieutenant, like Dora Lee mentioned, um, and giving the community like a view into that space, like breaking down that wall of silence, right? That kind of keeps the community out and, and you know, always assuming the worst, because what else would we assume? Because we don't have we don't have insight. We don't have a view into that space that you live and breathe every day right inside inside the department we can't see that so it just leaves us to our imaginations to assume the worst right um like there could be all this evidence that that that, that shows how great cops are but we can't see that right and so uh, that, that's one way forward and um um and the change the change that i personally want to see is that there's just no audience uh, among police officers for what you wrote Right. Because clearly there, there, it wasn't just you just writing these terrible things in a vacuum. Right. There, there was an audience for it that you were that, that you were writing to. Right. And so I want there to be no such audience for those kinds of writings. Right. Whether it's in Arlington or Massachusetts or in this country. Right. And that audience for your writings, I mean, it scares me and it makes a lot of people uh, feel deeply unsafe. Right. And the last thing I'll say is, like, personally, uh, I, I find that last option. Uh, of you kind of becoming this 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 agent of change, this champion of change, uh, I find that really hard for me to swallow because like my anger, my outrage about all this, like doesn't want to see you in a positive light, doesn't want to see you succeed as some sort of hero, right? And like maybe you're not up for that, like may maybe you just don't have it in you to do that. Um, uh, but I, I think those are your basic choices. Like there, there's there's no status quo here anymore, right? The status quo, I mean, that's shattered when you publish those articles. And everything else that's happened that we've been following in the news ever since, right? Like that, that status quo just like it, it, it just can't hold anymore, right? So it's like go big or go home, basically. Those are the options. And it's like I want what I would love to hear, whether it's like tonight or in a follow on conversation, which I hope we have a lot more of, um, where we can get to like what, what are the things that you commit to, right? Because you can't just take like a passive posture and say, okay, I'll do anything you want. Just tell me what you want me to do, right? So you have to be, you have to be the, if, if you're going to be the change agent in this, like you have to drive this, right? You have to, I, maybe you should read all these books from like Ibram Kendi and all these other people, or maybe you shouldn't, right? Like there needs to be action and whatever it is gonna be. I mean, um, I, my, my guess is that like, you know, those books probably aren't gonna do you a whole lot of good right now. Maybe, I don't know, but like there has to be some action. You need to, you need to find a path. You need to dig deep and find a path to action that's going to transform this situation. If, if you can't do that, then e you need to show courage either way, bottom line, right? Either you have the courage to step away and say, you know, I'm not up for this challenge. I'm being honest with myself and the community. I'm not up for this. I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to go somewhere else, right? And let people heal without me, right? That would be pretty courageous, actually, right? If you did that. But there's another form of courage, which I'm pretty skeptical of, um, which would be that, that, that you actually, drive this change that you are proactively you are you are, you are driving it forward you are coming up with ideas you are going to you are reaching out to people not just sitting there waiting for them to tell you what you should do to make this better right and so that, that's what i want to see from this thank you greg thank you for that i want to just stress something that is coming up as i think about greg's comment and everyone else's uh, lieutenant padrina this is directed at you but this is not just about you to zane's earlier point um, this is about law enforcement. So people, all the things that are people are suggesting and they want to hear and they want to see uh, and they want to believe. Um, I hope your colleagues, uh, other officers, both in Arlington and across the country, uh, Officer Jones and others uh, can share this message that it's really about, we people want change uh, and we want change in law enforcement. So Greg, thank you for that. I want to go back to Zane and then to Drake. Sure, Michael, you had something specific for me? Or? 
No, no, I think, you know, you, you got to, so some of us on this call sort of think about this stuff, but you work on it, right? You, you're charged when people call you and there's an inc incident with police. Um, you know, what do you, what is your thinking, Zane, in this moment, as I know you've been weighing in on the police reform bill uh, that's pending in the legislature right now. And I just want to acknowledge we have some elected officials on the call. Uh, 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 Senator Friedman is on the call as well. So, uh, Cindy, thank you for being on the call. Um, Zane, what is what are you expecting as you're engaging with elected officials on police reform? How do you tie that to what we're asking of Lieutenant Pedrini in this moment? Some of what's in that bill is meant to weed out officers who think this way uh, and do this kind of uh, 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 racist emoting uh, that could lead to uh, treating certain communities uh, in a in a discriminatory way. Sure, Michael. Well, we would love for Lieutenant Pedrini, as Greg was saying, to help drive the culture change, you know, be a part of the solution. Apologizing all day. This has been going on for two years. We can go, have it go on another two years, but it'd be better if we can find a better solution going forward. At the NWSP branch level, which encompasses Arlington, our branch, as well as several people that are on this call now, Greg is working with me a little bit. Barbara Thornton's in there working with me. And in the state level at NWSP, we're working to get the strongest bills passed possible. So that involves attacking the things that we believe are the real issue to accountability and policing. Like Lieutenant Pedrini, you mentioned body cameras and such. I'm not that big on body cameras. I'm old enough or young enough, however you want to say it, to remember Rodney King, et cetera, et cetera. We've had the footage for years. Nothing gets done. We want to attack this wall that stop things from getting done. So we believe qualified immunity, which is one of the biggest things that's prevented that. We believe the power of police unions. We believe police unions are a conflict of interest to the safety of Americans, to be quite frank. So we want to address those two major things as well as, you know, change the way officers think. We don't want officers watching Sean Hannity and listening to Rush Limbaugh every day and then think it is a war going on against police. Yes, Lieutenant Pedrini, we agree. There's some people that hate police that probably want to see police officers die. I'm not one of them. Most people are not one of them. I. I do not want to see a police officer sniped or killed like was done in Dallas in 2016. I do not want to see what happened last week. I want police officers to be able to go home to their families just like I want every black and brown person to go home to their families. Like, I'm 30 years old, I'm light skinned, so I have a privilege as well. We've talked about privileges. I don't have dreadlocks, I'm not six foot five, I'm not dark skinned. You know, if I had one of those things, I would be even a greater target. But me being, you know, five foot eight and light skinned, I've been stopped in New York City for just walking, doing nothing. I've been slammed against the wall, checked for drugs and guns. I've never even touched a gun before in my life, to be honest. I've never even seen cocaine or anything. So I've been checked for this stuff just because, for what? And the police officers joke about it. They think it's funny. They're like, yeah, what you got? What you got? Left pocket, right pocket. Where's the rock at? Like, it's not a joke. They're playing with people's lives. Some people are losing their lives over this. Not everyone's getting murdered over it. Some are getting beat up. Some are having their reputations tarnished. Some are losing their careers. So. That being said, let me continue. Like we wanna address these things that are stopping accountability. Officers should be able to get rid of bad cops. The union should be protecting them. Uh, as long as that happens, we're gonna to continue to have this issue. So we wanna see that driven home and we wanna see you be a part of the change to help change this culture of thinking of people thinking there's a war going on. If you wanna fight in a war, join the military. We don't want these people policing our neighborhoods. Thank you, Zane. I'm going to end it out on Drake and David, because I know, David, I want to get you back in this conversation. So, Drake, you up and then David. There's so many pieces to put together in this conversation, right? I think it's going to take time to get all those pieces to fit together into a solution. I loved what Greg said. Actually, I was really scared by what Greg said, pointing out that no one would have written those things if there wasn't, well, and no one would have chosen to publish those things if there wasn't an audience for it, right? That's the underlying scary part. Um, I really like how within the last few comments, the conversation has turned forward to the future. There is no undo in real life. So, you know, looking back only works so far in terms of trying to assess the damage and comfort people, but looking forward is how we make change to prevent this from happening again. And I like the idea of turning, it's the lemonade out of lemons, turning negatives into positive. Rick put himself into the spotlight, um, not, not for good reasons, but we can turn that 
I hope he will work to turn that into a positive, right? Like turn, turn every event that's happened, get the most out of it going forward. Um, I think it's not um, to say, I don't think it's fair to say police brutality has gotten worse. That implies that it used to be better, which I think is a very dangerous and false premise. I think body cameras, like this is the body camera. Like this is why we notice now is because the, you know, even if the police have body cameras, whether they're using them or not, everyone else on the street has a body camera. And that's what's really made the difference now. Um, hopefully everyone involved can help make a difference in the right direction. And we can get to this future that Greg talked about where there is no audience for this. And everyone is just thinking on the same, we're all in it together type of attitude. Thank you, Drake. And before I go to you, David, I'm going to say, uh, Lieutenant Pedrini, I think people just as much you, as much as you wrote those those pieces uh, two and a, two plus years ago, I think it would be I would encourage you to write some other pieces going forward uh, as you evolve in your thinking, as you share what you've learned and how you think differently of immigrants or people of color or social justice workers or civil rights groups or whatever that is. Uh, I'm gonna encourage you to jump into some other publications and, and write. Uh, I think one of the things I remember so vividly was a CNN special with a Ku Klux Klan member who had turned his life around and then spent the rest of his life turning others around who thought that way. Um, you're not that example, but I think your words uh, speak volumes to a lot of us. Uh, and I would love to see you uh, be an ambassador for change, not just go through a restorative justice program, but lead other people to that level of consciousness. David? Um, just you know, kind of wrapping things, you know, all these pieces together, I think about what Dora Lee said about using your position, using that uniform and that position of power. And this has been such a long, hard process. It's clear that this process has been long and hard for the town, but also for you uh, and the weight of it. You referred to you know, wishing it had been completed a year ago because that already seemed like a long time. And I just want to frame that if you think about, it's been two years, right, um, that you've been facing this and dealing this and hearing these conversations and taking these questions on. Um, we don't all get to, to um, choose the burdens put upon us, right? As a gay man, um, as a son of refugees, as a parent to a black child, um, we have to live for a long time with the things that are thrust upon us. And it's, what do we make of that? How do we use that position? You know, um, I, you know, I grew up religious. It's like, how do, we, how do we preach from that position? And so you've got this burden on you that you're not gonna shake for a long time. And so what to do now is, how do you lead from that position? You know, is it by making sure, you know, getting a retraction out there? Is it by speaking up for what you have learned? Because um, we all need it. You know, my, my daughter's growing up in this town and I, you know, still very clearly remember the first time I had the talk with her about going out with all of her black friends um, who were, they were 13 at the time and knowing what it meant for them to move in the world in that space where this culture exists. So, from this experience as you're in our town and in our police department, um, how will you lead? How can you show us? And I, I hope that you do. And I hope that you have more years of showing that Rick Pedrini that you aspire to be and wish to be than the two years that we've seen from those letters. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, everyone uh, on the reaction panel. And thank you, Lieutenant Pedrini, uh, for being part of the conversation. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to the town of Arlington. Uh, it has been an honor uh, to be invited into this community conversation. Uh, and I hope, Lieutenant Pedrini, uh, that not only your individual change, your personal change, that is uh, uh, your process you're going through, but that it leads to change in other officers. I will say this again. Not many towns are doing these conversations. Um, this is rare. Uh, many police departments and towns would fight a conversation like this because they wouldn't want it to be a public apology. This could be a model for other communities, not to sort of flog you in the pub public, but to talk about what it was, how you um, felt and what you thought when you said it, how people perceived it, and what we can do going forward. So I wanna say thank you to the town of Arlington for even hosting 
uh, this conversation tonight. I turn it back over to the town. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Lance Michelle, and I'm a consultant uh, with the town. Uh, I am interested in this work, and I got into racial justice work because I have had deep experiences with racism, and I've also had deep experiences with being targeted by police. Um, my, my father was falsely arrested uh, for a crime that he reported um, where he was being attacked, but because he was the black man on scene, uh, he was taken into custody. And he tells me to this day that it was the first time he had ever cried as an adult. That was 26 years ago, and he still remembers it like it was yesterday. I myself, at the age of 14, while walking with a group of friends, were, being, were uh, stopped and frisked by police officers who said that we looked like a group, um, a suspicious group. So profiling and racism is something that's deeply embedded in the uh, way in which policing happens in this country. We can't deny that. But racism itself is embedded through all aspects of, of our country. And I appreciate the opportunity for us to have a conversation with Officer Padrini, because as Mr. Curry said, Many people and many communities, as all communities across this country, are grappling with racism systemically, institutionally, interpersonally, and internally. Most communities wouldn't do something like this. And so Arlington is actually take, taking the right steps. Have those steps always been the best? Have they been messy? Yes. But that doesn't mean that the work, there isn't work going forward. And one message that we want to make sure is clear is that the issues that have come to light or have certainly been uh, imploded as a result of Officer Pergini's words were existent long before Pergini and will exist long after. And the work that it's going to take is not going to just be on the town leadership. It's going to take all of us personal and professional changes in order to grow, in order to bring our community together, and to heal from this disease, this other disease that we're contending with that's called racism. And two years may seem like a long time to many of you. I understand. Two years feels like, why are we still talking about this? Let's just get it over with. But two years compared to 400 years of systemic oppression and racism is a blip in time. How we move forward together is, is going to determine the future and the success of this town. There are some of you who are coming from all sides of opinion, all sides of emotion. And guess what? Each and every one of those emotions are valid. But my hope today is that you have been inspired to take some steps to educate yourself if you are not educated on the issue of race and race relations in this country. And it's not just about reading books, although you should start there, because there are plenty of books and there's plenty of evidence to support that this is real. This is not a made up thing, despite the fact that there's a lot of national arguments against that. What we hope is that you will make some efforts to talk to people who you normally don't talk to, get to know your neighbors, spend some time reflecting on how are my actions being motivated by preconceived notions, predispositions that were passed on to me? How have I absorbed that? And how do I, do, how do I exact that in my own profession? Because it's not just police officers who harbor racism. It's doctors, it's lawyers, it's barbers, it's grocery store clerks, it's delivery men, everyone. Everyone in our lives we've been impacted by. And the thing about racism is that it's not just about being an anti-racist for the sake of those targeted, but it's also about being racist, anti-racist for yourself. Because that healing that you undergo in yourself 
is what allows us to evolve as a country. It allows for that healing to take place. So I hope you all will consider that who are watching and we thank you all who stayed with us for the entire evening. And I'll pass it to Adam to make a final closing comment. Thank you, Alenza. I have to admit, I didn't know I was going to make a final closing comment, so I had to reshift where my computer was sitting as I was as I was watching. Um, I want to say uh, thank you to Alenza. Uh, a tremendous thank you to Michael Curry for the time he spent tonight and his respectful but very firm uh, questioning of Lieutenant Pedrini. Uh, I want to thank Lieutenant Pedrini for participating tonight. Um, I think I think we got a lot. Um, a very, very, very clear suggestions of where where the road can lead, um, and, and I look forward to having those conversations with you and Chief Flaherty. Uh, and and I, I think the last thank you I want to give is to the panelists. You are all private citizens that didn't need to do this. Um, you not only gave us your time, but you gave us passion and thought and. You, each of you really gave us a, a piece of yourself tonight and your own experience. And I really, really appreciate that. Um, the final thing I'll say is I very, very much meant what I said at the start of tonight's program. We, we've done a lot of work in Arlington, but we firmly acknowledge there's much, much more work to do on these issues of race. There are certainly issues of race and policing, but they go far beyond that. And we're committed to that work. We're committed to the, the hard conversations that it will take. And we hope that really starting tomorrow, we can more, more broadly begin these conversations across the community. So thank you to everybody who tuned in tonight. And I look forward to talking to you all soon.